What's up? This is a review of Homo Deus, A Brief History of Tomorrow by Yuval Noah Harari. This is the sequel to Sapiens, a very good history book. I would read that before reading this book. And this reminds me of the Back to the Future series, where you have the future, past, all colliding with the present that we're learning from. The title means human is God. And since we have all these predictive algorithms and analytics, can we predict the future from analyzing the past? Humans have won. We are the apex predator, a giver. His style is history, a bit of psychology, and reveals human nature as well. I do recommend Sapiens for the typical person. It gives them a glimpse into history, a more of a real history, yet from a scientific background. What you can learn from Sapiens is how groups of humans can collaborate and do great things. Money is a story, and humans are a storytelling machine. Now that humans are able to collaborate, what will the future be with humans collaborating with robots, AI? Are we going to become cyborgs? And now there are not many dangers. Our hunter-gatherer past, the Industrial Revolution. We are interested in survival and reproduction, but also happiness. We are more likely to die of sugar, so avoid ice cream and video games. And I see around me people are more pleasure animals. We have an excess amount of leisurely time. We are setting forth the knowledge upheaval as you can look at this channel. A few criticisms of this book and Duval are he's an intellectual. He's too nerdy. Too much logic with AI and the technical abilities. He's pro-feminism, which I can agree with, yet not. And it's somewhat a ripoff of Guns, Germs, and Steel. Although that is just mostly the intro into where we are now. There's overuse of liberalism in the book. What does he mean by that? There's a disregard for skills and aptitudes, other types, not just intellectual. And I don't think you mentioned, I could be wrong, the corporation's control and almost slavery to the humans, buying government and working hand in hand with the government in connection to surveillance. There's not much criticism. This is still a good book and a great sequel to Sapiens. Next is the takeaways from this book is he does have a very good writing style that will interest the public. It's well written and there's humor involved in sprinkled type moments. And he offers very clever metaphors and intricate details of explaining history in, in a fun way. Money is a story and that throws people off topic and it is very easy to understand, but simply the public will not understand that. And he has great explanations between communism and capitalism, where capitalism spends and hires, it never stops. There's low interest, they're spending, they're importing people to take care of old and make more jobs. There's delegation creating more jobs and using these profits to grow and hire more. It's almost an endless cycle where you don't have to analyze and be conservative toward how many tons of rice you have so you can export it to other countries. When people have money, they don't know what else to do with it. Just reinvest. Also, I link below the history of Czechsisku's last speech. It's in YouTube. I'll link that below. And I didn't know about that. He's a former Romanian dictator. And it explains how revolutions start. We have inside of us an animal cooperation. And for any revolution to start, I'm going to explain these three things. For number one, there is a control of networks. Whoever has power will control this network blindside you with power and refrain from giving you the truth. Number two, they prevent rivals. They would destroy the rivals, maybe out of fear, maybe out of attention. They won't give them any attention or bully them. Number three, they will rely on, on support from sister communist. It doesn't necessarily have to be communist, but that ally, somewhat like the axis of evil, a friend helping a friend just to prevent you from losing power. And this is important to discover power and to rally how people can make a difference, how even the zombie mob can make a difference. Some may be useful idiots, some may be powerful beings such as Gandhi. Yuval does interesting tidbits on terrorism and starvation. They don't really happen in the modern day. I do like the explanation of lawns, how lawns are almost useless. I'm not saying like the golf course, but in front of your home or in front of the White House, they're just like a display of wealth. They're first world problems. He does recognize gay movements are out of control. There's algorithms. There's human biases within us, and that creates cognitive dissonance. Humans are almost a delusional animal. There is war and the reality of it. There's fake history of the painting that he displayed with the glory of one of the leaders on a horse, yet not even fighting in the battle. Who is actually in the game? There's something close to me where there's Oakland and Moneyball, where 
the tactic is to hire the cheapest players for the most amount of yield who are just good enough. Not outstanding, but a good deal. Cheap and good. Another interesting factoid is the Johnny B. Good song by Chuck Berry is some part of the lyric. He wanted to say colored boy, but they had to change it to country boy to make it more PC and better for capitalism. It could appeal more to the white crowd. And last but not least, he used the word elephant maybe 30 times. So it's a good shout out for us. And this will be a section on tech. He's right about some of the robots replacing workers that we should not really fear it. It is going to happen such as chefs, bakers, and accounting. They will be replaced. There will be improvements in health scares. Google is the first to find out just by searching alone. There will be less cars. The self-driving cars I do not think are going to work as much, but I think they're going to be doing short routes. The algorithm is a boss. Tech is a religion, and his future is humanism, yet I think it's more animalism. I think he does overvalue the useless class and unemployable. There are always going to be jobs. There's always work to be done. Information wants to be free, and there are going to be revolutions coming up. And to end this off, I want to go through a few more interesting things about the book and statements to ponder. No one knew what human rights were back in the day. There were no these rights, rights for this, rights for that. That is why I travel. I do see freedom in a sense, even though you might have to buy yourself out. There are not all these rights. No one's concerned about rights. It's first world problems. Also, there's the Elvis Brand story, how he is able to profit long after his death. There's a story involved that captures people. And in Sapiens, imagination is powerful. In the future, there's going to be chaos. And this chaos is going to be versus the government. Chaos is coming. As well as intellectual property, there are raw materials, energy, and knowledge. Though the three things to hoard. There is kind of, especially close to me, there's the double race. There's going to be rich and international schools with air purifying systems like they have in China. And they're going to have everybody else. Also, San Francisco rich, they're going to have food delivered to you. There's daycare. There's Uber and Lyft driving you around. They're cooking for you. There's robots doing your stuff. There's bums there. And a service industry to these elites. And you got to think about how China and India all want that middle class lifestyle. This is going to affect the world, this ecological Armageddon. The answer is not in a city. The future does hold chaos. There's natural laws that always find a way out. And I don't think tech will intrude too much because the animal spirit is going to find a pathway to freedom and the ecosystem is just going to change. And I would check out Sapiens if you haven't read it, as well as be reviewing his next book, 21 Lessons for the 21st Century. That'll be coming up soon.